oftentimes we think that kindness somehow is weakness, right? And that it's not strength and to be a military leader, um, you have to be strong. And that if people show kindness, other people will think they're weak and well, they'll walk all over them or they'll be defeated in battle. But I think that we have the whole paradigm wrong. And it's, a, it's, it's, it's the system of thinking that our metaphors are all about, it's a battle, it's a competition, right? Colin Powell understood that the how we get there, how you treat people, how you um, listen to people, how you think about things as a whole and what outcome is not just the best for me as a leader, but the best for those I'm leading, which is what leadership really is all about, that he's an unbelievable model of that. And we can find kind leaders in all areas of leadership, right? And we need kind leaders in all areas of leadership because leaders influence how their followers act. Hi everyone, I'm Tracy O'Rourke. And I'm Elizabeth Swan. And we're from the Just In Time Cafe and welcome to our podcast. At the cafe, we wrestle with tough questions. We talk to thought leaders. We discuss great books and we get insights from Lean Six Sigma practitioners. We also let you in on helpful apps, bring you the news and challenge the status quo so you can build your problem solving muscles. Hey Elizabeth, what's on the cafe menu today? Let me tell you, Tracy. Today's highlight is our interview with Karen Ross, author of her latest book, The Kind Leader. During the writing of her book, Karen asked people to define kindness and she did not expect what she heard. So we'll find out about that. Next up, it's an app that provides you with professional presentation graphics to edit, refine and build on. And for Q&A, we asked our problem solving community how they deal with the new work from home culture and the rise of people being on 24 seven. And lucky for us, we're on right now, which means we're gonna have a great day at the cafe, Tracy. That is right. <laughs> Up next, it's hot apps. Yes, Tracy, today's app gives presenters a head start. So I stumbled across this helpful application many years ago, and I wanted to pass it along if you haven't heard about it yet. The application is called slidemodel.com. And if I didn't have you, Elizabeth, I would be using this app all the time, but you are so talented that I don't need this one. <laughs> but I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that do need it. It's an application with over 30,000 PowerPoint templates. They're 100% editable for presentations. So if you need some pizzazz into your presentation templates or your slides and you don't really feel like you've got a lot of design capability, well then rather than spending tedious hours trying to design a PowerPoint, you can leverage the creativity of the designs that are available to you in this application. It's sort of like having your own personal PowerPoint designer and you know, not for a lot of money. So what I like best is that this, the, these PowerPoints are 100% editable. They are not images that are pasted in. So sometimes that limits your ability to craft customized PowerPoints or presentations because things are images. Well, that's not the case with this. 100% editable, you can change the colors, fonts, sizes, shapes of everything on the slide. So you can search PowerPoint images or infographics, shapes, presentation templates, or backgrounds, things like that. Um, so one time, I'll just share how I used it, was I was looking for a way to graphically represent the steps for a process walk, and I wanted something fun and, and nice looking, and so I just searched steps. I thought maybe a step uh, graphical that looked like it was a series of steps. And it came up with several ways I could use steps to enhance the slides. So I was pretty excited to kind of just look at them and view the different ways that they graphically would show steps on a PowerPoint slide. And so you can, it also has a featured section as well as a new section for each of the four main sections of these offerings. So they have things like 
um, like I said, infographics, shapes, presentation templates, or backgrounds. And you can have a featured section for each of those or a new section for each of those. And you can search things like Leem, Six Sigma, PDCA, Demaic, and they've already got templates ready that you can, again, like I said, just use them the way they are, or you can change the colors or the sizes or the fonts or the text. Or you can even search things like change management or culture or other care categories. And, um, and did I mention that they have 30,000 templates? <laughs> so you could be in there for hours just looking at what's available. What will pop up when you do a search is a smorgasbord <laughs> of choices with multiple designs already pre-built for you to choose from. It's actually kind of fun looking at all those options. So what did you think about it, Elizabeth? Yeah, I agree. It was kind of fun. Uh, it's fun looking at images. And I was impressed with how sophisticated the graphics were. You know, I'm I'm on the picky side. I have, you know, the, the graphics background. So you can type in, I typed in PDSA. I immediately got a full color circular graphic with, I like the colors. It room for me to put in my own details about each step in the cycle. But like you said, they've got an immense library. So you can search on just about anything. So the breadth and depth was beyond what I expected. And then I looked at pricing, like I usually do. And, uh, you know, the templates are royalty free. So that's not how they operate. If you don't have a subscription, you can download a free bundle of their free PowerPoint templates. And uh, obviously, it's it's only like 150, you know, that you get in that bundle. So it's a lot less than the 30,000 that you just yeah. mentioned. But you can start there to see the quality of the graphics, see what you think. There's also a one day 2490 option that includes five downloads. You know, maybe you urgently need to create a presentation. You want a broad selection, but you don't want to commit. Then there's a plan for 5990 for three months. And that gives you a hundred total downloads, but they limit you to 10 a day. So again, you can do a limited subscription just because you need it for something coming up or a few things that are coming up. Then there's an annual plan for 99.90 and that gives you 200 downloads a month, which seems like a ton. Like, I don't even know what the heck I would do 200 times uh, if I was doing it. But after that, you jump to the 199 a year plan and that's just unlimited. So quality solid, you can alter the colors, match your brand, which is nice. You know, if you don't have the time or ability or resources to put high-end graphics into your PowerPoint presentation, this is a really easy option. Yes, I really liked it. So we'll include the link to slide model on the podcast post on our website so you can check it out. I'm Elizabeth Swan and you're listening to the Just In Time Cafe podcast. In a short while, you'll get to hear our interview with Karen Ross. Next up, it's a question we pose to our community about how to manage this new work from home culture. You know, how do you draw limits without disappointing clients, managers, and colleagues? And this is kind of addressing the reality of people working late, working weekends, you know, and trying to assess, you know, is this required of you? Or is this the culture? Is this what we're doing to ourselves? And it just reminded me, um, our colleague Crystal brought this up, but it reminded me of a project team I was on years ago. It was two different consulting groups and we were working on the same project and we were on site. We were in this big war room and we were designing a continuous improvement transformation for a large multi multinational corporation. And there was camaraderie between the two consulting groups, but there was also an unspoken competition. And the norm that no one talked about was to be the earliest in the office and the last to leave. You know, we wanted to look good. We wanted to look like we were working really hard for the client, but I, I, I know that everyone was exhausted. And I'm convinced a lot of our work was done in this total fog. And then I think about another organization that I was a part of where staff were putting in 12 and 14 hour days. You know, some people adapted, sacrificed time with their families, many left in tears, turnover was really high, the job requirements uh, formed a really harsh culture. It drove long nights, tough weekends, and a lot of burnout. So, you know, people might feel the, you know, now that they're working from home, they might feel like they need to res 
respond to emails in the moment, like right away, you know, they're not in a cubicle. So how do you be seen, you know, and that's, you know, is it the culture requiring at, us to do that? Or is it us or, you know, are we sort of helping to form the culture? And, you know, Tracy, I know you have a lot of demands on your time. You know, you've got uh, work, we got, you've got family. How do you struggle with this? You know, do, or do you struggle with this? Absolutely. This is a constant struggle for me. And as you know already, Elizabeth, saying no just to my clients or just saying no to the workload is really hard for me. Um, and I think working from home and trying to have, I, I don't think really it's work-life balance. <laughs> I think it's just work-life effectiveness, right? And I feel really bad because my kids probably see the back of my head more than any other part of my body <laughs> because I'm constantly sitting at my desk. Ah, <laughs> my poor kids. And so, I think um, it, this is a struggle for me. And I think part of it is just, you know, I do love my job, of course. And so it's like, oh, that sounds fun. I get so excited about stuff. I'm like, yes, 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 yes. And then I'm like, I can't. <laughs> no. And I, I have not quite mastered it. But I will say that I, I attended Deandra's class at the beginning of the year. And I ended up, in order to meet my vision of better self-care, I actually created standard work that I would check on every day. And, you know, am I caring for myself? Am I caring for things, you know, things that uh, are good for me and doing the things that are good for me? And I find that that method works really well for me because it helps me stay focused and realize when I've gone off the rails. <laughs> and so, um, and so I, if I stick with that, it can really help. I just, sometimes I get away from it. Right. So, and again, what do we do with continuous improvement? We fail, we get back on the horse, we try it again and try it again. So yes, I totally empathize and can, and really feel the pain of, of what people are struggling with. Absolutely. And you point out, you know, we're problem solvers and if you fail, you get back on the horse, but also you use standard work a lot. You're really good at carving that out. And I know what you're talking, what you're saying about Deandra's workshop. She left us with a requirement to like make this daily, right? And you did that with standard work. So I'm impressed. Uh, that's a great way to address it. So we put this question out to our community as we do at least once a week. And we got great responses from people about how they handle it. So author and customer service expert, Jeff Toyster, said he learned a lesson in college where part of his grade was class participation. And instead of being the first to respond, like some of his co-students, or the one to respond the most, like some of his co-students, he learned to respond with value, where he really thought about it and he didn't respond until he really had something to say. And he said he carries that with him. Um, and that brought up this idea of what I call imaginary measures. You know, do we invent metrics that we think we're being measured on, like how late or how early we respond or whether we respond on weekends? Like he was dealing with a class that was thinking, oh, it's the number of times you respond or it's how fast you respond. Right. So there we invent measures in our head of what we think uh, is effective or, or is um, is being perceived as effective by those we're dealing with. Right. And. Senior process analyst uh, Stephanie Hill pointed out that working from home is convenient for a lot of people, but then you have to carve out the time that's yours, right? Like you were saying, don't let the boundaries become permeable, uh, which I know we wrestle with. Then on the flip side, quality consultant Karen Ginsbury, um, she said that working from home seems great in theory, but she finds it super hard to set boundaries, so she ends up really frustrated. And she pointed out, and I so appreciate her candor, she pointed out the complexity of our egos. Like there's a fear of looking bad and there's a desire to be needed. So she was really frank about the stuff that we don't always acknowledge. Those things are at play, you know? Do you see those factors at work with people you coach and teach? Absolutely. The, setting the boundaries is really hard. And I sometimes feel like leaders don't really realize the impact they have and how much their actions affect the workplace, how we treat people, 
the behavior, the culture. I witness it over and over. If a leader sends an email on weekends, well, guess what? Everybody else is on their email on the weekend. And I remember when I was in a leadership role, I really made it a point not to send emails on the weekends because I did not want people to be checking their emails. Okay, if I check my emails, I should be able to do that if I want to, but I shouldn't have to force other people to check their emails because I'm sending them emails on the weekend. So I really tried not to send emails on the weekend unless it was an urgent situation, which I tried to make a rarity. Um, and so, or, you know, even like you said, Elizabeth, getting in there early or staying late, if leaders do that, then people feel, you know, they feel compelled to do the same. Or if people are mean, they're going to be mean to other people because it's allowed. And so just watching how, well, sadly, watching how bad leadership can really affect the culture and, you know, setting those boundaries is really important. Yeah. And what you mentioned about not sending the emails on weekends, you can actually, there's an app that'll let you set emails up to send, but on a Monday or Monday morning and not over the weekend, right? You're in the middle of working. You don't want to stop. So we might have to cover that app, Tracy. Just mm -hmm. don't let me forget. Good idea. Yeah. And then we heard a same on the same post, we heard from Karen Ross and Karen Martin to um, what we would call just powerhouses and they posted like about loving their work just like you said it's it's so hard to say no because it's like yes I want to do that that's awesome I would love to be involved in that but they're they're feeling like they're happy putting in hours that other might consider over the top and and for them it's a source of joy so just being able to say that and not have not be judged you know for being workaholics uh and then another great input was from healthcare curriculum director Carrie Fu and she brought up the term tangible results. So it's important to consider why we're working. You know, she recommended a system of tracking, not just your hours, but what was produced in those hours and then sharing that with leadership. You know, the results should speak for themselves, not how late you work. And what I took from the responses to this post was that boundaries come in many forms. So taking a true lunch break to recharge. I think that came from Robin Tillotson declaring the start and end to your day, logging off email and only checking it at designated times, you know, allowing yourself a break from it and then focus when you come back. So burning out doesn't help personal productivity. So make the design of your workday a conscious choice and remember to celebrate your accomplishments, you know, what you, what you got done. So great advice from so many people. Our community is honest and generous. You're absolutely right, Elizabeth. They are honest and generous. And you know what's funny is we sometimes get on the phone, all of us, especially our women and lean folks, and we go, gosh, everybody's doing so much. How come I'm not doing more? And I'm thinking, we're all doing a lot. <laughs> it's enough. It really is enough. So yes, I know what you mean. I'm Tracy O'Rourke. You're listening to the Just In Time Cafe podcast. We host these monthly, so you can go to the www.jitcafe.com and go to our podcast page. Coming up next, it's our featured guest, author, keynote speaker, lean and creativity coach and consultant, Karen Ross, and our friend. Elizabeth, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about Karen? I'd be happy to. Karen is the co-author of the Shingo Award-winning The Toyota Way to Service Excellence, Lean Transformation in Service Organizations. She's published five books since that one, and her latest, The Kind Leader, just came out this past month. She also recently launched The School for Kind Leaders. An experienced lean consultant, coach, and practitioner, Karen is the owner of Karen Ross Consulting. Using her unique practical creativity approach, Karen teaches organizations around the world how to create peak service experiences by combining coaching, creativity, and Toyota Way principles and practices. Karen has been a regular contributor to the Lean Leadership Ways Industry Week blog and has also written for the Lean Management Journal, Industrial Engineer Magazine, and LEI's The Lean Post. A practicing artist with an MFA in sculpture, Karen lives with her family in Naperville, Illinois. You can learn more about Karen by visiting her website at www.karenrossconsulting.com, all one. And as we say in my family, there are no flies on Karen. And why is that? Because <laughs> she's moving too fast. <laughs>
Welcome back, Karen. I. <laughs> I love thinking back to meeting you in the lobby of the Murano Hotel during the Results Washington Conference. We interviewed on the podcast five years ago when you had five. just published your first book with Jeffrey Liker, The Toyota Way to Service Excellence. Now you are back having published your sixth book. Six books in five years, Karen. The, the Kind Leader. We are happy and we are honored to have you back. We've got many questions for you. Well, first of all, thank you for having me back. It's shocking to me that it's already been five years since we met each other because it always feels like we've known each other a lifetime. And then five years just goes by so quickly. Who can believe it? Everything that's happened in five years. I know, crazy. Yes, uh, Karen, you know, it's crazy because you had just come out with that book with Jeffrey Liker. And now five years now, you've, you've, you've had your own consulting company, you co-wrote the book, and now you're really focused on love and kindness, a school for kind leaders, and your new book, The Kind Leader. And to me, this has been a, a shift in your focus, it seems, but I'd love to hear a little bit about the trajectory of how you've morphed over the last five years. Do you wanna tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely, and that's a great question. Because, um, you know, although the two things seem to be a, a shift or a morph, I don't actually think that they really are. And, you know, lean, we have the, you know, two legs or pillars, continuous improvement and respect for people. And I find that oftentimes people are focused much more on the continuous improvement part. And there's a lot of definition. We have a lot of tools. We have a lot of principles practices on that side, but actually the respect for people side, I think is a little less, less defined. And I think that a lot of the work I've done and a lot of the content that was added for Toyota Way to Service Excellence and How to Coach for Creativity and Service Excellence actually focuses on the how we get there, mm -hmm. right? The means. And as I was traveling around speaking and teaching, at so many different conferences, I really had so many experiences where I saw unkindness and it really bothered me. It's not only now during COVID that people were unkind to flight attendants on planes. It actually is something that maybe we didn't notice before. Uh -huh. It's something that I noticed. And you know me, whenever I see a problem, I think somebody should do something about the problem and the problem is me. <laughs> And it started with Love and Kindness Project Foundation and giving out our uh, love and kindness buttons. And really, as I saw even more unkindness during the pandemic, I thought, again, somebody has to do something and the somebody is me. Well, what I love <laughs> about that is in your book, you write, why did I write this book? Because it's needed. And that is the true essence of a good action oriented person who wants to make a difference. They see a need and they're filling the need. And I guess that explains a lot about why you are where you are and the trajectory of what, what you've done over the last couple of years. So exactly. you've got so much stuff going on. <laughs> well, thanks, but, you know, in, in lean on the continuous improvement part, we focus a lot on looking for the root causes. And as I, you know, stayed at home and didn't travel during the pandemic and was really reflecting on a lot of things. I really thought, well, like, what are the, the causes of all of these different things that we're seeing? The social unrest, the, you know, just climate crisis. And as I reflected and I thought about it, I really thought there's two things. And when you put those two things together, they cause disastrous outcomes from all of us. And that's failures of kindness and failures of leadership. Combined, I believe those are the causes of just a lot of what we see in the world right now. So I actually think this work is simply a continuation uh -huh. of work that I, you know, you can see that I started in 2016. It was before that, but this is just a continuation. Uh -huh. of it. Yes. You just mentioned that term failures of leadership and that you know, it really strikes a chord probably for 
most people, because whether you see it writ large or just your own personal experience in an organization, it, it's there. And then on the flip side, um, which is, you know, all the news today is an example of a successful leadership. And I'm talking about um, former Secretary of State Colin Powell. Uh, and you quote Secretary uh, Colin Powell, who passed away today, and you feature him as a model of a kind leader. And what strikes me is, you know, he served in Vietnam. He was a general. Could you describe for our listeners how someone could be a kind leader in the military? <laughs> I think that's a, that's a great question. And I think oftentimes, and as Colin Powell said himself, because actually he has a chapter in one of his books on leading with kindness, is that oftentimes we think that kindness somehow is weakness, right? And that it's not strength and to be a military leader, um, you have to be strong. And that if people show kindness, other people will think they're weak and well, they'll walk all over them or they'll be defeated in battle. But I think that we have the whole paradigm wrong. And it's, a, it's, it's, it's the system of thinking that our metaphors are all about, it's a battle, it's a competition, right? Colin Powell understood that the how we get there, how you treat people, how you um, listen to people, how you think about things as a whole and what outcome is not just the best for me as a leader, but the best for those I'm leading, which is what leadership really is all about, that he's an unbelievable model of that. And we can find kind leaders in all areas of leadership, right? And we need kind leaders in all areas of leadership because leaders influence how their followers act. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> I, um, I really love your quote too about you're saying, you know, actually people think it's weak, but it is a sign and it shows confidence. It shows confidence that you can be kind. And I think people don't really, that doesn't resonate as much with people for some reason. And I think it's very interesting. I think it's because really just like all other things, and this is another way that, you know, this work is really just an, a continuation of the work I've done in the past with Lean is that this is a systemic problem, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's a systemic problem that we think that leaders have to act a certain way. And it creates this, what I call in the book, a vicious circle of fear. And perhaps you'll remember from, you know, those old comics when we were children that the leader shouts at the employee, the employee goes home, shouts at their spouse, the spouse shouts at the child, the child kicks the dog. And, you know, whatever your leader models is what you take home. And then when you wear, as I say, your leader hat, because we all switch between our leader and our follower hats during the day. That's how you act. And it perpetuates the system. And actually, I was speaking with our fabulous friend, Deandra Wardell. Uh -huh. And she said, well, it doesn't end there, right? Uh -huh. That child goes to school and bullies other children. Uh -huh. Then they grow up and they become exactly that kind of leader. So the system perpetuates and recreates itself. And that vicious circle of fear, fear creates more fear and unkindness, right? And it's a result of more fear and unkindness. The only way to change a system is to change the inputs to the system. When we change the inputs to the system, we will create different outputs to the system. So having leaders actually act with kindness, speak with kindness, model kindness, to the people that are following them, well, then those people will put on their leader hats and act that way when they're at home, when they're in the community, when they're leading school boards, <laughs> leading city councils, right? 
and we will change the system for the better and the kinder. So and one input is your kind leader book. <laughs> And your kind leader, the School for Kind Leaders, which is also available. And you've got your love and kindness project. So tell us about how these all work together as, as really inputs, if you will. If somebody really wants to be a kind leader, we've got some tools. So tell us, what do they learn when they go to the School of Kind Leaders and read your book, The Kind Leader? Well, well first of all, I would like to say about uh, The Kind Leader book is that it's not just a book about theory. You will find a lot of theory in it. But in order to create that different system and to lead with kindness, we need to practice, right? None of us is 100% kind all of the time, certainly not me. So we need to practice acting, speaking and thinking kindly, the three kind leader practices. And when you read the book, it's not just for reading, just in time, you're going to do the exercises. Just in time, right? And so as you read the book, you're practicing. And the amazing thing about that is every time you practice and you lead with kindness, you create a change in the system and you create a better outcome uh -huh. and a kinder outcome for the person you're interacting with. Practice helps us develop skills. It also is important to practice with a like-minded community, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. as we know from Women in Lean, mm -hmm. that when you have community support. So that's why I created the new School for Kind Leaders. So you can sign up for classes that are on these specific topics. So they'll go more in depth than in, uh, you know, than in the book, because it's a book. <laughs> and then you can connect with other like-minded people and become part of the kind leader practice community so that you can be supported in practicing leading with kindness. When people say, oh, lead with kindness, that means you're weak, doesn't it? You're gonna need to have a supportive community around you to help you make that change. So that's how they all go together. Yeah, um, that's great. And I love the idea of the supportive community and the information, like your, your book is full of great examples of people dealing with challenging situations and what they've learned and and how they navigated that we you know kindness is not a weakness and you know how to stay the course so one of the great points that you make is that words matter right and there are there are corporate norms that tend to dehumanize people you know as if you know when you're on the job you're another person you're this other person that behaves in this other way you know, is there one area of corporate speak that you find yourself working harder to help people with than others? Absolutely. And I'm going to give you one word that comes to mind mm. today. And that is, we should never call a person a resource, right? A resource, when you think about it, is a natural resource, something that can be used up, depleted. It's finite. The more we use it, the uh, the more obsolete it's going to get. I mean, your computer is a resource. After three years, if you're in a big organization, they're probably going <laughs> to send it out, right? People are not resources. When we actually treat them with kindness, when we help them learn and grow and develop, they appreciate in what they can do. They become more than they ever thought they could B, so, and actually there's a second part of that. When people give your organization the, what I call the gift of the time of their lives, they're never gonna get that time back. We all have a finite amount of time here, right? So we actually need to treat people like people as human beings. So I think it would have a huge impact if instead of calling HR human resources, where we're going to just deplete people and spit them out and <laughs> chew them up and spit them out, right? We call this human relationships. What difference would that be? How would we feel? How actually would leaders treat people if what we were focusing was on human 
relationships. Yeah. Or, or real estate or fine wines or other things that just get better. <laughs> just <laughs> that's, right. that, that's exactly it. I'm not a resource, right? I'm not the thing. Leaders often are focused on ends, on things, on the bottom line, on growth, on sales, on mergers. <laughs> Those things are things. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, there was a leader you gave an example of that kept saying, the number is the number. You know, like that was just like this mantra and who I think realized this is someone you worked with, right? That was like, had to sort of come back from this like dehumanizing focus for, for everybody. People aren't numbers. And in fact, if we really think about it, when, 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 when we start to think about people as a number, there are many cases in history in which that had disastrous, disastrous impacts for mm people, people who had numbers tattooed onto them, yeah. right? For uh -huh. humanity, uh -huh. failures of leadership, failures of kindness. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, you do, as Elizabeth said, have a lot of great examples from a lot of people that uh, you know in your network. And we were just curious, how did you decide who to interview and who, who to highlight in your book? <laughs> Actually, you know, I just put a call out onto the internet and I, and of course, there were a few people that I asked because I knew their stories fit with, uh, you know, what I wanted to show people. But I actually just wrote and said, would you like to be interviewed in a kind leader interview? And whoever actually wanted to be interviewed, I interviewed them all. And everybody who was kind enough to give me the gift of their time to be interviewed appeared in the book. Every single one. Uh -huh. That's awesome. Um, so. It. And what a great network, what a great um, response. Uh, it's personally was fun and, and uh, fascinating to have people like Deandra show up or Michelle Hewa, Leslie Henkler, just the, the, the richness of people I know and have spoken with uh, and their worlds. Was there anything unexpected that happened while you were writing this book or because of writing this book? Well, there's always, there's always unexpected things. So first of all, I think one of the things that was joyfully unexpected was and continues to be the number of people who want to help, the number of people who want to be involved, the number of people who, who said, just like I said, well, when there's a problem, I want to, I need, I, the person who needs to do something is me. So that was unbelievably joyful. The other thing that was totally unexpected and expected at the same time, when I asked people the question, can you define kindness for me? Was actually people's inability to have a definition of kindness. They could tell what, they could tell about an act of kindness that they did. They could tell about an act of kindness they received. But that definition of what actually kindness is, people really had to think about. Um, that was fascinating. And I, I love that it came down to action, mm -hmm. right? I mean, empathy, there's things that go on with how you feel, how you think, but, but kindness is action. That stuck with me. Absolutely. Yeah. And, it's, and, and this is why it's a practical guide. We're not going to change the system. We're not going to make a kinder and better world by thinking about being kind to others, by thinking about changing our leadership style. Uh -huh. We're going to do it by changing what we do. And what we do is going to, again, back to the fact that this is circular, right? Mm. It's going to change our thoughts. We can start at any point. We can start with, Speak kindly, we can start with act kindly, we can start with think kindly. They're all going to influence each other as practices. Uh -huh. Well, darn it, that was going to be the next question I was going to ask you was we all want everyone to read The Kind Leader because I believe you when I say we need more kind leaders in this world. So if there was one thing you could tell people to say, this is something you could do today, what would it be? Something that you could do today 
is to when you hear somebody say something, whether you're wearing your leadership, your leader, your leader hat or your follower hat, monitor yourself for what your response to that is. Chances are, and you can read in the book why, it's going to be a negative response. Oh, I don't like what that person's saying, or oh, I disagree with that person, or oh, that person always does this to drive me up the wall, right? Pay attention. And then when you have that negative, unkind thought, give yourself a timeout. Just say, timeout, stop. Let me write down some other possible reasons that this could have happened, uh-huh. right? You can, you can do it right now you can start, because noticing where that connection is, right? And your own unkind thoughts, that will break the cycle. You know, Taichi Ono, this is going to go back to lean. Taichi Ono told us that we are wrong in everything we assume 50% of the time. Only 50? <laughs> Only 50, probably more, but wrong. And how many times do we make assumptions, right? How many times a day do we make assumptions if we just stop? And most of them are negative assumptions. We're just hardwired that way. We are critical thinkers. And critical thinking has the word critic in it. You're immediately looking at how is that wrong? How, how would that, how could I break that almost? You know, it's like, that. just, there's, I look, I'm looking for flaws because in some ways it's, it keeps us alive. You know, we're looking for danger. We're looking for um, how things could go wrong. But then that, as that's a constant refrain, um, it, it doesn't lead to a good necessarily kind place. The other thing you say, which resonated with me, and you just mentioned it again, is the fluidity of being a leader and a follower, that you are shifting your hats all the time. And to get comfortable with that, to not have any rigidity around your role, because it it absolutely changes. And the question I have for you, because obviously this was a big undertaking, I appreciated it so much looking at the research you did, the folks you spoke to, your own reflections after you asked questions and thought and, and listened to what you heard, like, the, like you're saying, people couldn't define kindness. What's, what's something that you learned as a result of, doing the, of, of writing this book? You know, I really learned that people are tired of the way things are. People are exhausted and they don't necessarily know what to do to change things or and it's not even or else. And they feel that whatever they can do, their one thing is not going to be enough. And so really it's been very important for me to, to and you'll see in my posts, the <laughs> things, you know, my little videos that I, my live streams I put out is that actually the one thing you do to lead with kindness when you're wearing your leader hat, because you're going to influence your follower, that you don't have to be the person who solves world hunger, right? You're one word of kindness to someone. You don't know what's happened to them in the rest of the day. You're one act of, okay, you go ahead of me in the supermarket, right? You don't know that that person is trying to get home quickly to take care of a sick parent all you need to do is do your part do that one thing say that one thing stop yourself from thinking the one negative thing and making the assumption it's enough all of us together doing our part will change the system that's that's really what i learned that nobody thinks they're unkind and everybody thinks it's it's not what can i do but the truth is you know that hopey poem that says we are the ones that we've been waiting for. Mm. We're the ones we've been waiting for, every single one of us. When you wear your leader hat, when you're coaching your kid's soccer game, when you wear your leader hat, when you're um, out there in the community, we're the ones we've been waiting for. I love that. Mm. You know, I... um, I don't know why this this idea in my head keeps arising, but 
I think about when many of us are unkind and it seems to be okay, right? And that is, there's even a term for it, road rage, right? Like somebody drives by you and you're like, that a-hole, right? And it's almost acceptable to do that, right? And if your kids are in the back or, you know, now they're like, they're five, they're like, yeah, a-hole, right? And to really like think, let's take a step back for a minute and let's, uh, what would be more uh, of a kind thought? Because we are modeling, it's action, right? There's somebody watching you. And kind of what you said, like, I wonder why they're in such a rush. Maybe there's something going on. Because clearly when we're driving, not so great. We just say, well, it's because of my situation. I got to get to the hospital or I got to pick up my kid. But when we other see other people rushing around, we think they're just a-holes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And a lot of that is just, again, changing our thinking. The thing about kindness is actually focusing on others and better outcomes for others. As human beings, we're extremely self centered. Mm-hmm. And we spend most of our time thinking about what's better for us. I grew up in the 80s and 90s, the me generation, right? Me, 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 me. But I think that again, and especially if you're a leader, you've been given the gift of leading all of these people. You need to be thinking about them, right? As I said today, we trust people when we know that they have our best interests at heart, not theirs. So, How do we think outside of ourselves, stop assuming things, stop worrying about the ends, what's going to happen to me, and actually start focusing on other people. That's what kindness is about. And, you know, sometimes people think, well, if I don't get my share, I'm not going to have enough. Mm -hmm. The truth is what I've found is in focusing on others and focusing on that kindness, it's all come back to me. It's come back to me and all of the people who want to help and all of the people who wanted to spend their time sharing stories and all of the people like you who've invited me onto your podcast. It creates a a unbelievably wonderful cycle of kindness. Mm -hmm. That is the systemic change. It's the paradox and it's the systemic change. Absolutely. And speaking of kindness and thinking of others, You've now written your sixth book. It sounds like you have some sort of kindness agreement with your husband to take a break. So tell us about that and what's next for you. Yes. Well, I always say to my husband, because this is the sixth book in five years, I always say to him, okay, I'm not going to write any uh, more books. This is the last one. And he always laughs and he says, uh, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I can guarantee you're going to write another book. And actually a big thank you to him because I do the drawings and illustrations myself, but he is Mr. Photoshop and he puts them all into the uh, graphic format. So uh, it looks wonderful. What's next for me? Well, I'm going to focus on helping people create a kinder, better world. One of the things that I've been thinking about is since the book is filled with exercises is to start a guided reading club and that we can all read and do the exercises together. So I would say that's in the near term. Oh, that sounds fun. Yeah, we'll look out for that. I love in that term, probably another book eventually. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're watch- we'll keep our eyes on you as we always do. Uh, before we wrap it up, Karen, I just wanna say one thing. I traveled last week for the first time since before COVID and I found myself a a much calmer traveler because I was looking for moments where I could actually, you know, be helpful to somebody else. And I'm just saying that's, and that's probably the result of lots of things, but one of them is named Karen. (laughs) And (laughs) the last moment of the flight and I went to get up and I realized the woman sitting next to me was, you know, a businesswoman, you know, probably my age, but not as tall. And I looked at her and I said, can I get your bag out? And she's like, yeah, that would be great. Cause I'm like, I don't know if she can reach it. So <laughs> cut it out and put it down. And I think the flight started with me helping two 
rabbis check into a kiosk because they couldn't speak English and didn't have credit cards. Anyway, it was a really fascinating trip. And uh, I thank you, Karen, for my mm -hmm. richer experience. Well, thank you for your kindness because it made a huge positive difference to those people. And we're, we're the ones we're waiting for. That's all we all need to do. Look outside of ourselves, look around. There's always someone who needs your help and kindness. And didn't it make a, it is, just makes traveling and everything else wonderful. It does. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All I have thank to say you. is I want to give you a hug. So it's going to have to <laughs> hug my laptop. I'm going to have to hug my laptop and give you a heart. Oh. <laughs> Take care, Karen. We will see you soon. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And always a pleasure, ladies. Be sure to register for our November 11th webinar with strategist, author, and speaker, Joy Mason. Joy is going to teach us how to amplify diversity, equity, and inclusion by using Six Sigma. That's something a lot of people are looking forward to. And tune in for December webinar where Eric Olson, founder of Central Coast Lean, will feature his virtual lean coffee. He's bringing lean coffee to the cafe which means we're going to need more mugs, Tracy. Yeah, we're going to have lots of jolts of lean caffeine. And there's still room for you to join our next Lean Six Sigma Leadership Workshop offered through UC San Diego. Class starts at the end of January and goes for 12 weeks. We'll provide a link to that on our website. All right, we are very happy to have your company it is so awesome having you with us. The Just In Time Cafe is a great place to gather. Yes, it is. So join us next month for your jolt of lean caffeine.